Hello there! You can get the latest version of RetroArch on the official website RetroArch.com. If you're using Steam, then there's a Steam version with the convenience of automatic updates. Pick the version you prefer, go for Stable if you're downloading from the website, and either install it or extract it. Best to use a folder that is separate from Windows folder structure. Note that this software is free, so if you've paid for it, you got scammed. I will not be posting any download links of any kind, and I ask the viewers to follow the same rule no. and not ask for them either. Lastly, I'm not liable for any damages done to your computer if you mess up the configuration. It's broken! Beetle requires a BIOS file to operate. Let's place it. For this guide I'll be using both keyboard and mouse, along with an Xbox gamepad as my input devices. Go to the root folder of your RetroArch installation and navigate to the system folder, which is currently empty. Here is where you place the BIOS files for the core. You don't need all of them, just for the region of the games that you're trying to run. For US games you'll need SCPH-5501, for Japanese games, including translated ones, you'll need SCPH-5500, and SCPH-5502 for European ones. You can also use either PSP or PS3 region-free ones, but those will require an additional toggle to work. Currently, only commercial biases are supported, but this may change in the future. Once again, no. please do not ask how to get a particular BIOS or a game. Consult search engine results like from DuckDuckGo instead. Now we have to install the core. If you're using the Steam version, make sure that VTLPSX is added to your Steam library and that it is enabled. That's all you need to do, and you can skip to front-end configuration. If you're using standalone RetroArch, launch it. I recommend using a gamepad for navigation convenience. Let's full screen the software by holding left alt and pressing enter on the keyboard. In the main menu, go to online updater, then core downloader. Navigate to the bottom of the list or simply use search slash on keyboard Y button on Xbox gamepad and type in PSX. Beetle PSX HW is a hardware accelerated core and the one that is required for this guide. Once you've found it in the list, select it and it will be automatically installed. Needless to say, downloading RetroArch and using the online updater requires an internet connection, but once you've installed the core, your installation of RetroArch will never require a connection to function ever again, until you want to update either the front-end elements or the cores. So you can pre-configure and then transfer to another offline PC. Let's set up the front-end. Switch to Settings tab, Drivers option. Here in the menu, you can change how the user interface looks like. In this guide, I'll be using the Ozone interface. In Video, select Vulkan. Any recent dedicated graphics card will support Vulkan API, unless you're using a card that is 10 years or older. Beetle has the best results in Vulkan, so I highly recommend using it if your PC is compatible with it. Hate when random audio crackle and popping ruins your emulation experience? In Latency options, adjust audio latency to 128, and never worry about audio interrupts ever again. Playing rhythm games or you're extremely sensitive to audio delay? Then leave it at 64. Note that you can change a value by either selecting the option and picking it from a list, or simply use left or right buttons while the corresponding option is highlighted. Finally, let's restart RetroArch. Congratulations! The basic preparation of Beetle PSX is now complete, and the core is fully operational. If you're using a region-free BIOS of PSP or PS3, then you have to do this additional change. In the main menu tab, select Load Content, 
and point to your desired game. Open Quick Menu by pressing F1 or Xbox button. Scroll down to Core Options, then Emulation Hacks, and in the Override BIOS, pick the appropriate option. Close the game. You're all set. Now I'm going to show how to achieve the emulation look you see in my walkthroughs and streams. I will also showcase a few other configuration variations in the in-depth section of this guide. Beatles default settings output an image that is similar to native hardware, but without any analog signal distortion, not to mention the properties of a CRT display. To experience the intended look, you'd need a CRT display, and a signal converter, which can quickly turn into an expensive hobby. Without the proper equipment, there is not much reason to stay on this default configuration, as the image output on an LCD or an OLED will not match with the intended look anyway. First, I'll show which settings to change, then if you're interested in seeing what they do, stick around for the in-depth part. In the main menu tab, select load content and point to your desired game. If you have multiple cores installed, you'll be required to choose which one will handle the game. This needs to be done only upon the first boot of the game, and the association can be changed at any time, in case you picked a wrong core. So then, assuming you did everything correctly, once you pick the game, you'll see the BIOS boot, and the game starting. Let's pause by pressing F1 or Xbox button. This is your quick menu. Whenever a game is launched, you can access it at any time, and if you get lost in the front end, you can get back into it from main menu tab, quick menu option. Note. In long menus, you can use page up, page down, and shoulder bumpers on the gamepad to jump 10 entries in the list. Now then, in this menu, go to Core Options. In Video category, set internal GPU resolution to 8x, dithering pattern to off, multi-sampled anti-aliasing to 8x, MDEC YUV chroma filter to on, core aspect ratio to force 4x3. In emulation hacks category, set GTE overclock to on, skip BIOS to on. Back in core options, set renderer to hardware Vulkan, CD access method to pre-cache. Back in quick menu, go to controls, port 1 controls, set device type to DualShock, especially if you're using a gamepad. Back to controls, go to manage remap files and save core remap file. Back in quick menu, go to shaders and set video shaders to on. Then select load, shaders slang, anti-aliasing, fxaa. Pick save, and then save core preset. Now go back to quick menu, select close content, and then restart retroarch. This will save your current settings. Congratulations! This configuration is the most compatible baseline that will work with most games without the need of readjusting. Next settings may break compatibility with some games, but offer major improvements in return. It's best to apply these to games you're already familiar with. Let's launch the game again and head back to core options of the quick menu. PGXP. Precision Geometry Transform Pipeline is the category we're interested in. Set PGXP Operation Mode to Memory Only. This will minimize warping distortions. Set PGXP Primitive Culling to On. 
Set PGXP Perspective Correct Texturing to ON. Switching to Emulation Hacks category, to enable widescreen for a 3D based game, set widescreen mode hack to ON. Set widescreen mode hack aspect ratio to your desired one, in my case 16x9. To boost frame rate, set CPU frequency scaling overclock to 110% or 120%. Higher values are suitable for games with uncapped frame rate. Too high values will either speed up the game or risk breaking game logic. Lastly, in core options, there's CD loading speed. 2x native will work with any game while higher speeds can break the loading process. If a game freezes at a certain point, consider turning these settings to default or off. Be sure to check the next part of the guide to see explanations and examples of these settings. But with this, your Beetle PSX hardware configuration is complete. After pointing you in the right direction, it's best to explain what the individual settings do and bring some examples to the table. Be sure to check examples of advanced enhancements, especially if you've never tried them before. In Core Options, Manage Core Options category, you can save game options, which allows you to have individual settings per game. Ideal for when you've dialed down particular enhancements that the game requires, and also useful for when you want to experiment with the new settings without messing up your default configuration. Save Content Directory options is for multiple disks within one folder. These option files are applied automatically if there is one and can be reset back to your pre-configured settings if you choose to delete game options. Be careful though, reset options will reset all core related settings, even your own default settings, the ones we just configured. Back in core options, video category, Internal GPU resolution is one of the main enhancement settings that dramatically changes the look of any 3D based game. At higher resolutions, the distortion of 3D graphics is much more noticeable, so whenever possible, it's best to pair higher resolution with PGXP. The higher the resolution, the more it will impact your graphics card. For 1440p or 4K desktop resolutions, I've found that 8x is the most balanced choice, while 16x is a case of diminishing returns. You can crank the resolution all the way up, but expect a more severe performance penalty on your graphics card, especially if you are video memory limited. Dithering pattern is a setting for CRT displays. The pattern adds an extra layer of detail and color to the output image that gets smoothened out on a CRT. The pattern is not supposed to be visible or discernible, so assuming that you're using a modern display, this setting should be set to off, unless you really like the looks. When disabled, the emulator will run in high color depth mode, removing the need for tricks done by the dithering pattern. Texture UV offset is a useful setting for a better alignment of textures on resolutions higher than native. It's rare to see graphical glitches because of it, so I would recommend leaving it on. Texture filtering is more of a matter of personal preference. There are three distinct categories of filtering available to choose from. Unfiltered, filtered, and posterized. All of these have their own strengths and weaknesses, aside from unfiltered, which is universally compatible. A downside of filtering is that it exposes the seams between the 3D game textures. Nearest provides clean, sharp pixel art, and if you're uploading to YouTube, then that's going to be smoothened out by compression anyway. This is the closest to unfiltered presentation. It preserves text sharpness 
and looks consistent throughout any game type or visual element. Performance-wise, it's the fastest option too. Bilinear is the classic go-to choice to blur and smoothen out the textures. This method has been around for over two decades. It's fast and light on your system, but will also make text less readable and pixel art less appealing. Best suited for textures of 3D games. Three point is the methodology used by N64, similar to bilinear, but intended for a very particular type of textures. The current implementation is not good, and having textures up close to the camera produces rather ugly artifacts. I cannot recommend this method at all, as the artifacts stand out too much, and this does more harm than good, so avoid this one. XPR is the heaviest filtering available, intended primarily as a scaling method for pixel art and sprites. It significantly rounds corners and posturizes textures, as in makes them look melted, including text. This kind of filtering is far more intense on system resources. Keep that in mind if you're running on a lower-end PC. Best suited for 2D games, but is applicable to 3D games as well, changing the look of both dramatically. SABR has the properties of XBR, while supposedly also trying to preserve final detail by using a different method of edge detection. When compared to XVR, it seems to try to melt the text less, but also makes the overall presentation look less consistent and more ridden with artifacts, similar to 3-point, so I don't see a reason to even pick this one over XVR. JINC2 places itself between Bilinear and XVR, having the properties of both. It treats textures by rounding, posterizing them, which removes jacked edges and then applies filtering on top, which blurs the end result. Supposedly, this is the successor of Bilinear filtering, so it makes sense for 3D game textures but it absolutely destroys thin line text and oftentimes does not sit well with 2D artwork either. Heavy on system resources. The games run on different engines, have different types of artwork and texture resolution, so filtering will have varying results across the whole library of games. In the end, I would say Pick whichever option makes you happy. Exclude sprites from filtering is a setting linked directly to texture filtering. It tries to detect flat images within the game and prevent them from being filtered. This is a solution to avoid text, sprites and user interface being negatively affected by the filtering. Exclude 2D polygons from filtering is also linked to texture filtering. It tries to detect all flat objects within the game and prevent them from being filtered. The detection is unreliable and perfectly positioning the game's camera against a texture will cause a false positive detection, which is an undesirable effect. Use this setting only if excluding sprites is still not enough. If you're using nearest filtering, then these two exclusion settings do not require any tweaking at all. Adaptive smoothing is the best way to filter pre-rendered backgrounds and sprite-based games. It does not produce any seams between textures and does not filter anything 3D. If desired, it can be combined with other filtering methods, but those are likely to require additional exclusion settings. Super sampling is a way of playing PlayStation games at native resolution, but also enjoying most of the graphical benefits 
of the enhancements. By setting high internal resolution and PGXP, then downsampling, the end result is a more refined classic experience. The image has more detail, less distortion, and is anti-aliased. FXAA shader and retro arch's bilinear filter, not to be confused with the Beatles texture filtering, should be disabled for this one. Multi-sampled anti-aliasing is the main method of anti-aliasing, mitigating jagged edges and stair-stepping of 3D objects. The higher the setting, the more it will impact your graphics card's performance. My recommended setting is 8x, while also enabling FXAA shader for smoother edges. MDEC YUV Chroma Filter supposedly reduces macro blocking of PS1 videos. In other words, tries to reduce the negative effects of heavy compression. This setting is very subtle at best. And while I did notice a difference, it's evident only when paused and zoomed in. Have it on, but don't expect any miracles. Software Frame Buffer Make sure that advanced graphical effects are displayed properly. I highly recommend keeping this setting on, as the performance gains from turning this off would not be worth potential graphical errors or missing effects. Horizontal Image Offset is a setting primarily for widescreen hacks that need additional screen centering. If you've applied a widescreen hack and notice that either the left or right side of the screen is not filled, then this setting allows you to move the rendering area in either direction. This does not stretch the image. Core Aspect Ratio controls how the output image is scaled. This setting defaults to corrected, which is sort of a middle ground for compatibility. PS1 games are not that great at standardizing the output image, so tweaking aspect ratio to be perfect in one game will make it distorted in another. If you want to set and forget, then I personally prefer the legacy Force 4x3, which scales the image to a 4x3 ratio unless widescreen hack is engaged. This setting is also related to crop overscan which defaults to dynamic. Dynamic removes all padding on all sides of the image and is most suitable for modern displays. If you feel like tinkering with aspect ratios, then head to the main menu of the front end. In settings category, video, scaling offers integer scaling for pixel perfect looks and manual aspect ratio overrides, which will give you freedom to correct the scaling of more odd games like Tomb Raider. Next, we're off to PGXP category. This is one of the most important settings for PS1 enhancements, as it tries to eliminate the shortcomings of the original hardware. It is not perfect, and that is why this category of settings may require occasional tweaking when switching between games. PGXP Operation Mode is the setting that enables the correction of the notoriously wobbly 3D. Memory Only is the most compatible setting, but various games will react differently. There are games where PGXP does not work at all, Others, where only memory plus CPU setting will actually make a difference. While in other unfortunate cases, this setting may cause RAM overflow and freeze the game. If you're playing PS1 games at a high resolution, then this setting is a must. Keep it on memory only. PGXP 2D Geometry Tolerance is a tweak for games that exhibit buggy behavior within their 2D elements whenever PGXP is turned on. If a user interface looks wrong, try tinkering with this setting, otherwise leave it turned off. 
PGXP Primitive Culling helps to fix seams and holes within 3D geometry whenever PGXP is turned on. It's best to keep this setting always on. PGXP Vertex Cache attempts to fix seams and alignment that primitive culling does not catch. This is a last resort setting, so try it whenever everything else fails, but under normal conditions, this setting should be off, as it is highly likely to produce graphical glitches. PGXP Perspective Correct Texturing tries to fix warping and distorting textures. It's a major graphical improvement, and setting it to on is highly recommended. There are a few games that had their own tricks and workarounds for texture correction, so if the textures look more messed up than they should be, set the setting to off. Switching to Emulation Hacks category, here are the options for both widescreen and overclocking. Almost all the PS1 games were intended to be played at 4x3 aspect ratio, but it's possible to enhance specifically 3D ones to run at wider aspect ratios without stretching the image, with just one caveat. 2D elements like a user interface will get stretched and can be misaligned. When widescreen mode hack is set to on, the game will be rendered beyond its original borders. While widescreen mode hack aspect ratio determines the width of set borders. Various games will react differently to widescreen hack. You may see culling on the edges of the screen, or the game's frame rate may decrease. Same as with PGXP, this setting can cause RAM overflow and freeze the game, or cause undesired graphical glitches. CPU frequency scaling overclock is a rather delicate setting that should only be attempted if you already are aware of how the game should normally behave. Overclocking can introduce serious game bugs the higher you go, so be careful. Increasing the setting can help to achieve stable frame rate or push the frame rate much higher than the original hardware ever could if the game doesn't have a frame rate limiter. 110 to 120% is usually a safe range. When a game has a capped frame rate that is tied to logic, applying overclock will only speed it up. If a game has frame dips, then bumping up a few percent will help smoothen out those inconsistencies. When a game has uncapped frame rate, chances are you can set a high overclock percentage and push the game to its limits, assuming your PC's CPU can handle it. Note that overclocking severely increases CPU resource requirements, so you will need a beefy system for it, but there is an option that can alleviate the load. The dynamic recompiler, which will be covered shortly after. GTE Overclock is a safe way of boosting frame rate in scenes that are bottlenecked by PS1's graphics coprocessor. In other words, if there's a graphically intense scene, then this setting might provide a significant performance boost, with a caveat that the overclock will not work if Dynamic Recompiler is engaged. Nevertheless, this should be on. Skip BIOS is a time saver. Set it to off if you're playing copy-protected games like Gran Turismo 2 or are a big fan of the startup sounds. Otherwise, keep it on. Back to core options. Renderer sets which way Beetle operates. In Vulcan mode, you get the best enhancements and the core utilizes your graphics card. OpenGL is in a similar boat, but with compatibility and enhancements being inferior. Software mode is not accelerated by a graphics card, therefore is extremely slow on resolutions above native. This guide is made with Vulkan mode in mind. CPU Dynarec 
is an option to speed up CPU-bound emulation. This is an important setting if you're struggling to maintain full emulation speed or need additional headroom for CPU overclocking. Outside of those two use cases, I do recommend leaving the dynamic recompiler setting on disabled. Running on interpreter has the benefits of not risking encountering any additional bugs, not having potential compatibility issues, being able to utilize GTE overclock, and running at a higher emulation accuracy. Max performance is the option of choice whenever you need the speed. The other two settings are supposedly a middle ground, but I would only suggest using them if max performance breaks compatibility or causes issues. Once the dynamic recompiler is engaged, there are three related settings that affect its performance. Dynarec code invalidation should be kept at full unless you're experiencing bugs that might be related to the dynamic recompiler. Toggle this to DMA only during troubleshooting. Toggle back to full if nothing changes. In emulation hacks category, Dynarec event cycle setting is what further increases the speed at the expense of accuracy. Despite the name, it does affect the interpreter. Try using it before outright switching to max performance. The higher the value, the better the performance. Under normal conditions, keep it at default. Dynarec SPU samples is a fairly new setting which I have not tested, but sound is something I would not mess around with as compromised sound will severely degrade your experience. Back in core options, CD access method determines how your game copies, specifically local images, are read. Set pre-cache and the core will load the whole game image before starting, eliminating any potential stuttering from something like a hard drive. This should be the go-to setting unless your PC is severely RAM limited. CD loading speed forces the games to read data at faster speeds, significantly reducing loading times but at the cost of compatibility. Too high values will outright break loading sequences, so I recommend leaving this setting on 2x unless you are willing to test how high you can go before it breaks. Back in quick menu, controls category is worth a mention. In port controls, you can remap the controls to your liking, change device type to DualShock to enable analog inputs and force feedback on your gamepad. Best of all, in Manage Remap Files, you can save your custom bindings per game with either Save Game Remap File or Save Content Directory Remap File for multiple disk games. If you're looking for hotkeys, back in RetroArch Settings, Input, Hotkeys is the place. You can rebind these to anything you like. In Port 1 controls, for example, it's also possible to rebind default keyboard inputs. Back in Quick Menu, Disk Control allows switching between disks. It is recommended to create a playlist within a shared folder whenever dealing with multi-disk games. To do so, go to the folder of the game, create a text file, name it, open it, paste the full names of the Q files or equivalent if you're not using bin Q format, one disk per line. Save and change the file extension to M3U. Load up the newly created playlist file. When required, you can swap disks by using eject disk, briefly unpausing the game, then changing current disk index and selecting insert disk. By using a playlist, the frontend will remember the disk you were on even if you close the game. You can still use load new disk option to swap a disk manually. Once you do point it, you can freely change back and forth, with a downside that manually added disk indexes will not be saved across different play sessions. It is up to you 
If you'd want to go through the hassle of playlist creation, or the hassle of manual disk swaps, is what I would say, but playlists also unify the memory card and save states. No need to manually toggle a shared mem card, and loading a save state from another disk will immediately swap the disk image for you. It just might be worth the effort. Shaders offer drastic image changes at the expense of additional processing load. There's an impressive amount of presets to choose from, and RetroArch supports combining multiple shaders together. The one basic preset I recommend is FXAA, a post-processing anti-aliasing shader that further smoothens out jaggies. Keep in mind that shader misconfiguration can cause the front end to crash, so be sure to save your settings by restarting or quitting before deep diving into experimentation. The reason why I suggest FXAA is that it's lightweight and that it enhances our baseline internal resolution and anti-aliasing. If you don't want to use shaders, then in RetroArch settings, video category, there is bilinear filtering toggle, which also achieves a smoothened output. By default, RetroArch includes memory cards within the contents of the save state, which means loading an old save state will overwrite your current memory card. If you're not aware of this behavior, this can lead to lost game progress. There is an option to decouple save states from memory cards if you wish to do so. Go to RetroArch Settings, Saving, and toggle don't overwrite save RAM on loading save state to ON. Lastly, in settings, on screen display, on screen notifications, it's possible to disable all alerts, widgets, notifications, and messages by toggling on screen notifications to OFF. This is useful when recording clean footage. So many settings can look intimidating at first. But with enough usage, browsing the front end will eventually feel more natural. If a game does not run properly, or the emulation is not at full speed, then it's possible to scale back some settings to claw back the performance. Generally, my recommended settings are suitable for mid-range PCs. If something goes wrong and the game is freezing, then I would recommend disabling more advanced enhancements first, and see if that helps. This includes PGXP to OFF, widescreen to OFF, CPU frequency back to 100%, GTE overclock to OFF, event cycles to 128, CPU Dynarec to disabled, CD loading speed to 2x, Disabling these settings will help troubleshooting if it's the enhancements at fault. This will not help if it's an actual emulation compatibility issue. There is no guarantee that the games will handle these changes gracefully, so my recommendation is to save to a memory card beforehand and do a clean reboot with the new settings. If that's not an option, at least have a save state before troubleshooting. If the game does start running properly again, you can't try turning these settings back on, one by one, until you've found the culprit. As a reminder, for copy-protected games, Skip BIOS should also be turned off. Whenever the emulation speed is below 100%, there are a few things you can do. First, make sure CPU frequency is at 100%, and GTE Overclock is set to OFF. Disable shaders if you have any enabled. Whenever your graphics card is struggling to render at a high resolution, first reduce multi-sampled anti-aliasing. If that's not enough, reduce internal GPU resolution. Consider switching texture filtering to nearest. For MSAA changes to take effect, the game needs to be rebooted or the internal resolution needs to be switched around back and forth. 
If it's your CPU that is struggling, toggle CPU Dynarec to max performance and set event cycles to the highest number. These settings play the biggest role in performance, so this is as fast as it gets, and if the emulation is still running poorly, then your system is not capable of running Beetle, and I would suggest trying out either standalone duck station or older software like EPSXE. Lastly, if the game is seemingly running at full speed, but the sound is occasionally crackling, then I would recommend double checking that audio latency is at least at 128. There's a third party tool called Mouse Injector Dolphin Duck, which allows you to use your mouse to control aiming. The project's GitHub page features a complete list of supported titles. Some may require activation of additional cheats to disable interfering controls or mechanics. The compatibility is tested and implemented manually per game, so the current supported list is rather small, but growing every week or so. To get the latest version, go to the Releases page, Assets section. The one you're looking for is Mouse Injector Dolphin Duck something, not the source code. Extract the contents of the archive in a folder. I recommend a dedicated emulation directory that is outside of Windows system folders, but desktop will do too. Launch a supported game, wait a little. If the game requires a cheat, then you'll have to do some additional steps. If not, then simply skip these steps. Go to Quick Menu, Cheats. Add new cheat to top, select it. Now go back and save cheat file as, give it a placeholder name. Now go to the root folder of the RetroArch installation, Cheats folder. The file you've just created should be here. Duplicate it. Open a copy with a text editor. Now we have a reusable template. All we need to do is to get the appropriate code from the mouse injector, as they're created for DuckStation and the file formats differ. Go to your mouse injector folder, Cheats, PS1. Open the appropriate file with a text editor. What you're interested in are the numbers that come after the name. Copy them and switch to the previously opened template. Paste them in the cheat0 underscore code section between quotation marks. Replace line breaks with plus signs. Add an optional description in cheat0 underscore desk field between the quotation marks. Save. To keep things clean, rename the edited cheat file. To apply, switch back to the cheats menu, load cheat file, the replace variant, Select our newly created file, enable it, hit apply. If you did everything correctly, then the cheat should be immediately reflected in the game. To have these pre-applied during every single launch, toggle Auto-Apply Cheats during game load to ON. Now that we're done with the optional detour, go to your mouse injector folder, launch the tool. Windows may prevent you from launching it, in this case, disregard the smart screen. You will be greeted with a warning that no configuration file has been found, and just proceed and press Ctrl plus 1 to continue. From now on, the mouse injector is fully operational. Note that it is highly recommended to play in full screen, and this tool may have difficulties hooking to windowed emulators. For demonstration purposes, I'll show it in windowed mode first. If you're using more than one monitor, be sure to set your mouse cursor to the edge of the screen so that you don't accidentally click on something outside the border of the game. It is also possible to use third-party software like Display Fusion to lock the cursor to one monitor. Switch back to the already running, supported game. Pressing 4 on your keyboard will hook your mouse to the game. If you did everything correctly, then you'll be able to control the game with your mouse. If not, try closing both RetroArch 
and mouse injector, then launch the game again, launch the injector and try hooking. Note that you won't be able to use your mouse and other applications properly until you unhook it by pressing 4 again. As you may see on the mouse injector window, it's possible to adjust a few things, some options depend on the game. The most notable one is mouse sensitivity, which can be adjusted by pressing 5 and then using either plus or minus respectively. The default RetroArch keybinds and hotkeys were not made with mouse aim in mind. Therefore, for the best experience, I would recommend doing custom binds that would mimic a recent PC control scheme. It's possible to use mouse and gamepad at the same time, but I doubt the ergonomics of that choice. Once you've confirmed that the tool is working, unhook and close the game. In main menu, select configuration file and then save new configuration. Go to the root folder of the RetroArch installation, config folder. Here you'll find the config file that is marked with date and time in the name. Let's rename it so it's more easily differentiated. This is a backup of front-end related settings, including keyboard mappings and hotkeys. If something goes wrong, load this configuration up and you'll be back to normal. Let's copy it and rename it. This is going to be our remap config file. Let's load it up so that we don't mess up the default one. Note that you won't be allowed to save the front-end configuration if a game is running. Now that we have a method of saving and restoring keyboard bindings, launch the game again, hook to it, then in front-end settings tab, go to input, port 1 controls. PS1 games have control schemes all over the place, so there's no universal layout that I can recommend. Experiment with remaps that suit you best, be sure that you don't map to a hotkey button. If you do, in inputs, go to hotkeys, clear the offending bind with delete key or rebind it to something else. This concludes the side tour of the mouse injector. And that's how you set up RetroArch, Beetle PSX hardware, and the mouse injector. I hope this video helped shed some light on the configuration process and demonstrated the settings well enough. As the time passes, the software will evolve and change. More settings may appear, and existing options may change locations. Keep that in mind if you're watching this in the future. Beetle features documentation that can be found on libretro.com, but the article isn't updated as often as the core itself, so newer features might be missing from it. The same is true from the front-end documentation. I tried to outline the most important settings, but it's not feasible to include every single option. If I miss something important, I apologize. Making software tutorials is not something I've done before, so don't judge this harshly. But for now, that's it. Enjoy your newfound emulation knowledge, leave a comment if this guide was useful, and support the channel if you can. See you around!